name is Matt, and I'm here to make a video and talk to you about the care, buying, feeding, maintaining a classic 1946 Piper J3. I've owned this airplane about two years, and this is going to be my experience. Your experience might vary, and there's certainly different ways to be involved in an airplane like this. So I'm just going to go over how it's worked out for me and some things to be careful about when you're buying and flying an airplane such as this. Now, they made Piper Cubs from about 1938 to about 1947. They built about 20,000 of them. There are a lot of them still flying. So your first question is going to be, well, what should I look for when I'm buying a Piper J3? There's a lot of these airplanes out there, and the price can vary a lot by what you're getting. Now, I looked at Trader Plane and a few other places before I came here, and I saw a lot of Cubs from around $23,000, $24,000 up to about $55,000 or $60,000. That's in the U.S. There's ones for sale over in Europe and things that are more expensive. Now, what's the difference between a $24,000 airplane and a $55,000 airplane? Well, there's a couple of things about how it's equipped, what kind of shape it's in, and how recently it's been restored. And I'll get more to the restoration cost and process in just a minute. Now, my Cub, when I bought her two years ago, I paid $26,000 for her. She was flying, in license, in annual. Everything was legally put together properly for her to be an aircraft that you could get in and go fly. She also mechanically didn't have anything significantly wrong with her. However, she is a very older restoration. She was recovered back in about the mid-1960s. So the first thing that's going to affect the value of your airplane is how recently was it restored. Mine was restored back in the 60s. The other thing that's going to affect it is how is your airplane equipped? My airplane has the Continental 65 horsepower engine. The 65 horsepower is probably how most of these airplanes were initially built. They did build a few of them with less horsepower, and a lot of them have been upgraded to 75 or 85 or 100 horsepower. It makes it a real performer, and of course it adds to the cost. Now, my airplane is also very basic in that it does not have an electrical system. That's how it was built, and that's how I plan on keeping it. However, some people will add alternators, generators, batteries, voltage regulators, so that they can add a radio or a transponder or something like that to the airplane. Personally, I think that ruins the classic character of the airplane, but depending upon where you fly, that might be something that's important to you. However, that's going to add to the cost. It's also going to add to the weight. Another common upgrade that you'll see, there's a few things that are commonly done to a lot of these airplanes which make them a little more expensive as opposed to one that doesn't have it. The first is the brakes. Now, my airplane has the original Cub expander brakes, they're called. Press on the brake pedal, it pushes against the diaphragm, a small balloon type mechanism expands inside the wheel hub and that causes the wheel to slow down. Sort of. They're not great brakes. Many Cubs have been upgraded with Grove or some other manufacturer disc style brakes. Similar to what you'd see on a Cessna 172 or a more modern Piper Cherokee or something. Those brakes are a little more expensive, they add weight, they're very good at stopping. So good at stopping that it becomes much easier to mash on the brakes and flip the airplane over on its nose. Now, my mechanic, who does my work on my airplane and also taught me to fly tailwheel airplanes and also restores airplanes, begged me to don't ever put disc brakes on this airplane. He says, if you have to use the brakes on this airplane and you need brakes like that, then you're not paying attention. And if you're flying on grass, he's probably correct. However, if you're flying on pavement, you do use the brakes a little bit more often. However, the newer style brakes grab so well that if you have a passenger in the front seat, something happens, you panic, you mash the brakes, they grab so well that you can put the airplane over on its nose. So I left mine with the expander brakes, partly because of cost, partly because uh, I just don't want to risk sliding over on the nose. You pay attention and you really shouldn't have to worry about hitting the brakes that hard. These brakes hold well enough that when you do a mag run up, when you hold the brakes and increase the RPM to check the magneto system before you take off, the brakes are, are good enough to hold the airplane still when you advance the throttle. So the expander brakes have worked for me. Another common change 
is what they call sealed struts. There's the strut that attaches from the wing and the fuselage. The original struts were hollow, water would get inside, it would collect in the bottom, they would rust, it would cause problems. So there was an AD, airworthiness directive, it's like a recall for airplanes, except they're mandatory. The AD required what's called sealed struts. These struts are welded closed so water can't get inside. Most every Cub I've ever seen already has the sealed struts. It's a very old AD, so most of the airplanes you look for should already have sealed struts. But that is something you want to check because you wouldn't want to get a good deal on your airplane, fly it home, and the first thing your mechanic says to you is you have to replace both the struts. So you also want to pay a little bit of attention to the spar in your airplane. Mine is a 1946, as you can see up there. Well, if I didn't have the cover on it, you could see it. Mine has metal spars. Many Cubs, especially pre-war Cubs, ones built during the early parts of World War II, were built with wood spars. Nothing wrong with wood spars. Lots of airplanes flying around on wood spars. I think it was wood spars that got Charles Lindbergh to Paris. However, wood has particular things that you need to be aware of. They can rot, they can get wet, they can get dry rot. Things can happen that can cause problems with your wood spars. So if you're looking at a Cub, you want to know if it has wood or steel, and you want to make sure that you check out the spars, that they're in good shape. It's not impossible to change them. Some people change out the spars when they restore it, but it does involve taking both wings apart and rebuilding them. So it's not something you just want to do at the drop of a hat. As I mentioned, and as I mentioned before, my airplane does not have an electrical system. Most Cubs you see are not going to have electrical systems. I have a portable radio that I charge outside the airplane, and I put it in the airplane when I want to go flying. What some people do is they'll mount a small battery inside the airplane. They'll run a radio off of that battery, and then they'll plug that battery into a cord, into a wall outlet when they park the airplane. That works well, too. You can probably have a little bit nicer radio. However, that does add weight to the airplane. Now, weight. The gross weight of this airplane is 1,220 pounds. That means it's illegal to take off and fly in it if you weigh more than 1,220 pounds. So one of the first things you want to look at when you're looking at an airplane is what is its empty weight. The empty weight is how much does the airplane weigh when it's sitting here with nobody in it, with no gas in it. Now, it has a 12-gallon tank right here. 12 gallons times 6.5 pounds per gallon is 78 pounds. It's got about 5 or 6 pounds worth of oil in the engine. So 78 and 6, you're at about 84, 85 pounds before you start putting people into the airplane. Well, 1220 minus the gas, minus the oil, minus the empty weight leaves you with how much people and baggage you can put in the airplane. This airplane weighs 683 pounds, which is very light for a Piper Cub. Many Cubs I was looking at when I was looking to buy one were 750 to 850 pounds. Well, you can do the math. 850 plus 78 plus 6 back from 1220 you might have an airplane that only has about 325 pounds useful load now if you're your average 1946 male this plane was built for and you weigh 140 pounds it's not a problem if you're a normal 2021 size person you don't want to buy a single seat airplane so I paid a lot of attention to the weight, and this was one of the lightest Cubs I found, and that was one of the things that made me interested in this particular airplane, as opposed to one that weighs more. People can also add things like wheel pants, which are these little covers that go around the wheels. They look really cool. They add a couple miles an hour to your cruise speed, but they add weight. So you find your airplane. You find that it's got updated spars, and it's got the updated struts, and it's the weight you want. You need to have a mechanic look at it before you buy it. Preferably not the mechanic that the person who's selling the airplane sends you to. You don't know their relationship. Now, one of the other things I'll mention about the history of an airplane. When I first started shopping for a Piper Cub, my father learned to fly in 1939 in a 40 horsepower Piper Cub on skis in Missouri. I've got a picture of him. He looked cold because it was winter. He owned several Piper Cubs throughout the 40s. I thought it'd be cool to own an airplane that my father had owned. I still have his logbooks. So I researched the N number, the registration number, and looked for them. I actually found two of the Piper Cubs he used to own are still on the registry actively flying. One of them was in South Carolina. I called that gentleman. I said, hey, if you ever want to sell the airplane, he basically declined and said he was going to be buried in that airplane. Fair enough. The other airplane 
by coincidence, was only about an hour north of me in Ocala. I talked to that gentleman, very nice man. He also said he wasn't really interested in selling. But when I was talking to him, I made the comment, I really wanted to own an airplane that my father had owned. Now, every airplane has a data plate. The data plate is sort of the ID number that airplane is given by the FAA when it's built. Everything else on the airplane can be changed, but the data plate tends to stay with the airplane. So I told this gentleman, I'd really like to have an airplane that my father had. He pauses and he goes, son, the only thing on this airplane that your father owned is the data plate. Meaning, he basically went on to say he bought it sight unseen, and when he got the airplane down to him, it basically had to be completely torn apart and rebuilt. And there were so many new parts he had to put in the airplane that the only piece of the airplane that left the Lock Haven factory that was the same now as when my father owned it was the data plate. And that's your always risk buying an old airplane. But as long as you have a data plate, you can build a new airplane. All it takes is money, right? Now, I didn't do that when I bought this. I actually called, this plane was in upstate New York. I'm in central Florida. It was mid-October, and I was in a hurry to get the airplane out of New York before the winter. So I actually called and talked to the mechanic who had just recently worked on the airplane, who obviously knew the owner that I was buying it from. I got, I got the idea that he was not overly attached to the owner and that he was going to be honest with me about the condition of the airplane. First thing he said was, Matt, it's not a show plane. And he was right. So I actually just went off his word and looking at the log books and getting the airplane down here. So I took a bit of a risk. It worked out great. The plane was exactly as it was described to me by the owner. And there were, there were no hidden bad situations inside the airplane once I got it. So it worked out. However, you do want to be careful about that. Preferably find a mechanic of your own choosing and somebody who's familiar with airplanes that are made out of tube and fabric like this one is. You don't want to hire a guy who all he ever works on is Cessna 172s to look at your Piper Cup. So find a mechanic. He's going to go through the airplane mechanically. He's going to check the condition of the fabric. And I'll talk more about fabric and restoration in a minute. He also was going to look at the paperwork in the airplane. Every pilot, when he got his license, he learned the acronym AERO, A-R-O-W. Used to be A-R-R-O-W, but they got rid of the requirement for a radio license. So now it's just A-R-O-W. These are the four things you have to have in the airplane for it to legally be able to fly. The A stands for airworthiness certificate. The plane should have a current airworthiness certificate. R is registration. The airplane needs to be properly registered with the FAA to be flown. O is operating limitations. You can have an owner's manual for the airplane, which will have this information, or you might have a little card like mine does, which has the operating limitations in it. And it also has to have a current weight and balance card. The weight and balance is what this airplane weighs, where this airplane's center of gravity is, and particular things about the weight of the airplane. If you don't have those four things, your airplane's not legal to fly. So you want to make sure that, the, that your airplane is properly equipped. You wouldn't want to get your ferry pilot that you hire who flies across country to bring your airplane back to you. He gets there and he calls you and says there's no airworthiness certificate in this airplane. On one of the Cub websites on the internet right now, there's a thread going on about a ferry pilot who flew out to the West Coast to bring an airplane back for a new owner. There's no weight and balance in the airplane. Now, he's trying to go around in the airport and find some people to get airplane scales, to weigh the airplane, to compute a weight and balance, to put a card in there so he's legal to fly it back. So you want to make sure the paperwork is, is accurate so that your airplane can be flown back to you. You'll notice my airplane has a wood prop. Some of them have metal props. The metal props tend to climb a little better. You get higher horsepower. You tend to want a metal, metal prop. You, you cruise a little faster. I like the look of the wood prop. I like the cheaper cost of the wood prop. The other advantages of wood prop is if you prop strike it, if you hit it, you're less likely to damage the engine because the prop will shatter and break. And all you have to do is replace the new prop. However, some of the common upgrades on airplanes, especially ones with the higher horsepower, are going to be metal prop. But I like the look of wood. Also, part of what your mechanic should be looking through in the logbooks is getting an idea of the history of the airplane. When you see ads for airplanes, you'll see it'll say complete logs 
which means you have the aircraft logs all the way back to when the airplane was first built, or you'll have logs from some year. My logs are actually from about 1954. The earlier logs are unknown. So there's no way to really know what this airplane went through before. But you want your mechanic to go through the logs, look for the, the ADs, like the struts being replaced, or the various other ADs there's been on inspections and things. You also want to get an idea of what the airplane's been through over 75 years. Was it ever used as a crop duster? Was it ever used to tow banners? Was it ever on a field someplace where it was given instruction in? So you had solo pilots out bouncing around off the trees and the hangars and the hills and everything else that they could hit in the airplane. You want to get an idea of what your airplane's been through. You can fix anything with time and money, usually both, but you want to make a knowledgeable decision going in what the airplane's been through. Now, mine had all that documentation. The only concern I had, and I really didn't have it because I didn't know about it at the time, but I think my ferry pilot might never have been in a Piper J3 before because the owner sent me a cell phone video of the ferry pilot leaving upstate New York. In spite of that takeoff, the airplane got here. So, good thing. Now, once you get your airplane here, you get it registered to you properly, you're gonna to have to do occasional maintenance on it. The first maintenance that comes to mind is your annual inspection. Every airplane, once a year, has to be inspected by a licensed mechanic who approves it for a flight for the next year. Now, my first annual inspection was $1,500, which, if you own a, a twin-engine Seminole, you would kill for a $1,500 annual. I was pretty pleased with that. This was the first time that this mechanic had ever seen my airplane. The mechanic who I use is a very, very big Piper J3 Cub guy. He's very familiar with Cubs. He went over it from the spinner to the tail wheel, and you don't ever know what he's going to find. He didn't really find anything. A few minor things. We had to replace a headliner. We had to fix one of the wing bows that was made on the airplane. And then the normal inspection. So the first one was $1,500. Now, I just got this airplane back last month for my second annual this year, and it was only $800. We didn't find anything additional which was wrong with the airplane, so it was just the basic inspection and some preventative maintenance. Change the oil, clean the oil, oil screen, lube the bearings, and a few other things like that. So um, your annual can be everything from less than that. If you know somebody who is a mechanic who will do it for cheaper, you also can do what's called owner-assisted annuals, which is where you do a lot of the maintenance as a non-licensed mechanic, and then a mechanic signs off on it. That can save you some money. Or you can have an annual where your, where your mechanic looks at it and says, this fabric is out of, uh, out of shape. You need to restore the airplane. That can be a little more money. But so far, that's what it's been for me. The only other maintenance I've had done in between the annuals, I had an airspeed indicator, which was acting up. Uh, there's another mechanic who I knew who's familiar with Cubs and he was actually able to drive over here to my field because my mechanic who does my annuals, I have to fly the airplane to him about an hour away. But I had a mechanic who came here and we went through the pitot system and found a, a blockage and eventually determined that the blockage was probably something inside the airspeed indicator. So I had about $100 in my mechanic's time in diagnosing the problem. I pulled the gauge out. I sent it up to a place called Keystone Instruments, which is in Pennsylvania next to the original factory. They rebuilt the Cub instrument, sent it back to me for $270, and I was back in the air. So that's the only other maintenance I've had, other than regular oil changes. You change the oil every 25 hours. I can do that myself. Um, I'll probably do a video maybe next month of me changing the oil when it's due again. This airplane doesn't have an oil filter. Some people add oil filter kits to their airplane, so it has a filter. Mine doesn't have a filter. It has a screen, which is supposed to pull things out of the oil. 
there's a way to take the screen out and you soak it in gas to clean it and you put it back in there, every other oil change. So other than oil changes in the airspeed indicators, the only thing I've had in uh, about 30 hours a year of flying is the annual inspections. You want to insure your airplane. Now, airplane insurance is not really, really like car insurance. It's more like boat insurance. The most significant difference being you agree on the value of the airplane when you buy the policy. So you will buy insurance and you will tell them what your agreed value of your airplane is should have something happen to it. My agreed value on mine is about $30,000. If you have a more expensive airplane that you agreed value at $50,000, it can be more expensive. You can also go without agreed value, and if you wreck it, you fix it yourself. So there's a variable in there. My insurance my first year was about $1,100. My second year, it was about $1,300. I'm waiting to see what it's going to be this year. I don't know. I haven't heard yet. So that market is always fluctuating up and down, so we'll see where that is. But it comes out, for me, about $100 a month. Now, some people, now, you can go without insurance. Depending upon where you keep your airplane, you might not have to have insurance. I have insurance, so if I taxi into a taxi light, there's somebody to pay the airport for the taxi light that I broke. Um, so I think you want to have insurance. Some people, as they're getting in their advanced age, you get up into your 70s, and a lot of insurance companies are dropping older pilots of that age, and they're just going without insurance. So that's up to you, and that's a variable expense by how, you, how old you are, how much flying time you have, how much flying time in a tailwheel aircraft you have, and other things like that will affect what your actual cost is. Significant things that's going to affect the cost of buying an airplane or the most exp expensive things that you're ever going to do to your airplane is restoring it. The airplane is made out of fabric. It originally was made with cotton fabric and they would put various chemicals on it. It would shrink it, get real tight, and they'd paint it. Most airplanes that you will find now have been recovered over their lifetime in one of the newer synthetic types of coverings. Seaconite is a popular one, Polyfiber, Stewart Systems, there's several out there. Because still, there's still a lot of airplanes even built now that you can build out of fabric. So the fabric market's very current. Now, your fabric can eventually get to a point where it has to be recovered. Seaconite, which is what mine is, uh, they say it's lifetime. Put it on, you never have to replace it. Well, it's not really lifetime. However, if you keep your airplane in a hangar, which I do to keep it out of the sun, and you keep it dry, you can get a long time out of your fabric covering. If you have to change out the fabric and restore the airplane, they're going to strip all the fabric off. They're going to fix whatever they find on the underlying steel fuselage or wings. And then they're going to recover the fabric. And then they're going to paint it again. You're probably looking at the bottom line beginning of around twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars to have that done. Now, let's suppose you buy an airplane for twenty-five thousand dollars, and then you spend twenty-five thousand dollars restoring it, recovering it. Do you have a fifty thousand dollar airplane? Well, you probably do. But let's suppose you overpaid. You paid forty-five thousand dollars for your airplane. That you then spend thirty thousand dollars to recover it. Do you have a seventy-five thousand dollar airplane? Maybe not. Maybe you still only have a $50,000 airplane. So you want to be cautious of the, uh, of the condition of your fabric or at least be mindful of taking care of it and knowing that, 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 that that's the big expense that might be out there one day is dealing with the fabric. There's also the risk that when you restore the airplane, you strip all the fabric off, you can find things wrong with the underlying fuselage. The fuselage is airplanes made out of steel. Steel corrodes. You can fix that, but depending upon how much corrosion is there and how bad it is to fix it, it can get expensive to have somebody fix the corrosion in your steel part of your airplane. So have a lot of, of unknown expense with the engine. Do you want to upgrade the engine? Do you want to put a bigger engine? Does the engine need to be overhauled? There's a whole bunch of conditions in there. A new engine for this would probably cost you $25,000. An overhaul just to replace some parts can start at a couple thousand dollars. Anywhere in between, depending upon your your mechanic and, and how you get into the engine and what you want to do with it, it's a very, a very big variable cost. But when you go looking at these airplanes, you will see everything, as I mentioned earlier, you'll see airplanes that look like this, and you'll see airplanes that look like this. You can buy and or restore yours anywhere in between those two. 
Another part of the restoration process is painting it. As you can tell by looking at my airplane, this color is commonly referred to as Lock Haven Yellow because they built these in a factory in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. You'll notice that my airplane, and from some of the other videos, my airplane is a couple different shades of Lock Haven Yellow. Some of this paint went on when it was restored in the mid-60s. Some of this paint has gone on more recently when there's been various repairs made to the airplane. You can strip and repaint an airplane without recovering it. I've been told by several mechanics that you can do that. It is both legal and approved under the FAA regs. I have also been told by several of those same mechanics, don't paint it because the process of stripping this paint off will very likely cause damage to your fabric. So your $4,000 paint job now became a $30,000 recover job. So as much as I would love mine to be a brighter, cleaner shade of yellow, it's just not in the cards right now. You'll notice my airplane has a wood prop. Some of them have metal props. The metal props tend to climb a little better. You get higher horsepower. You tend to want a metal, metal prop. You, you cruise a little faster. I like the look of the wood prop. I like the cheaper cost of the wood prop. The other advantages of wood prop is if you prop strike it, if you hit it, you're less likely to damage the engine because the prop will shatter and break. And all you have to do is replace the new prop. However, some of the common upgrades on airplanes, especially ones with a higher horsepower, are going to be metal prop. But I like the look of wood. Okay, parts. Can you still find parts for a 75-year-old airplane? Well, you can. Piper doesn't really support these with parts anymore, but there's two companies, most notably Wag Aero and Univision, but there's two companies that still support these airplanes with parts. Univair and Wag Aero are the best known, and they'll have most commonly needed parts that you can buy these. These are FAA approved parts that you can use to fix or rebuild your airplane if you break something. Now, you're only supposed to use, this is a certified airplane, so you're only supposed to use certified FAA approved parts on your airplane. There's an urban legend that the gas cap is the exact same gas cap that there's a John Deere tractor part number for. But of course, that would be illegal to put that on your airplane. What you would do if you wanted to replace your gas cap is go to Wag Aero or one of those and buy your gas cap. But let me explain the problem with that. This is your Piper J3 gas cap. It's a cork, it's a steel gas cap, and it's a steel rod. You put it in the gas tank, as the fuel floats up and down, it moves the rod up and down. You can see where this rod tip is from sitting in the airplane. That's how you tell how much gas is in it. Cork, steel rod, cap. Univera wants $168 for this part. So while they have all the parts, some of them can be crazy expensive. Now, another expense you're going to have is you have to park your airplane somewhere. I'm here in Central Florida, and as you can see, I'm at an airport, so I rent a hangar here. This hangar here is a little over $200 a month where I am. I'm on the east side of Tampa. I live in Clearwater over near the coast, about an hour away. If I were to move, there's an airport five minutes from my house, a hangar there would probably be almost $500 a month. Depending upon where you want to keep your airplane, what part of the country you live in, that can be a huge variable cost. But you're probably going to spend somewhere between $100 and $300. It's probably average around most places in the country to find a hangar. Some places which are very crowded, it can keep you a couple of years on a waiting list to get a hangar. Now, this is something you need to be careful of because as I mentioned with the fabric, you really don't want to store this airplane outside. It's not good for the fabric, and you wouldn't buy a classic 75-year-old car and park it in the street. You shouldn't park this outside either. So there you have buying your airplane, getting a mechanic to look at your airplane, getting your airplane moved to where you are, putting gas in it, putting oil in it, maintaining it, getting your annual inspection, and flying it and enjoying it. The only other thing I'll mention here as I mentioned earlier, since this airplane's gross weight is only 1,220 pounds, it actually fits under the FAA's light sport category, which means you can fly it with a light sport 
license rather than a private pilot's license. So if you're just starting out and say, I want to get a license and buy a Piper Cub, you can get a light sport license for significantly less than you can get a private pilot's license, and you can get in the air for cheaper. There's also some easier medical requirements to deal with under light sport as opposed to private pilot. So if you're a private pilot, you obviously can also fly a light sport. Light sports are determined by weight, can't fly more than 120 knots or so, which is not a problem, can't fly instrument, you only have two seats, and some other requirements. But if all you want to do is get a Piper Cub, then you can look into just getting a light sport license. Well, that's the basic rundown of my airplane experience with this for two years. Prior to owning this airplane, I owned a Cessna 172. Uh, the first annual on that was almost $6,000. Burned more gas, had four seats. I think 99% of the time I was flying, I was by myself. So why am I paying for four seats? Uh, somewhere along the line of all the years of renting Cessna 172s and Piper Cherokees and Warriors and things, I realized I wanted to go for a ride in one of these. So I found a person here just south of Tampa that, that owned a Cub and also an Aronka Champ, which is a similar type airplane. And he would give you your tailwheel rating, teach you how to fly a tailwheel, and let you rent them solo. There's very few places in the country that you can rent a Piper Cub solo. So if you want to fly one of these consistently, about the only way to do it is to buy one, because they're tough to rent. So I went down, and I got my tailwheel rating, and I realized that flying with the door open at 500 feet and 70 knots was the kind of flying I wanted to be doing. So I got rid of the Cessna, and I got this. Now, it's not for everybody. When I was coming back from my mechanic about two weeks ago, back up here to my airport, I had a headwind. My GPS said I was making 49 knots over the ground. But you should enjoy being in the air, so going slower, you fly longer, you build more hours. You can look at it that way. Uh, if you're out there renting a Piper at $180 an hour or something, this is certainly something to consider. You're not going to put your significant other in this and fly off to that town 500 miles away for a weekend. It's not really practical to that. But if you just want to get in the air and fly the way that flying started out and the way that you really just enjoy flying rather than necessarily getting somewhere, there's no better way than owning an airplane like this, driving to the airport, getting your airplane, pushing it out, spinning the prop, and going flying. So if you have any other questions, put them in the comments. Uh, thanks for watching, and keep flying.